After the end of World War II, the world was split into two, east and west. This marked the beginning of the era called the Cold War. The Computer Game Museum in Berlin, located in the eastern half of the city on a miles-long stretch of open wide road called Karl Marx Alley, has a back corner specifically set up to showcase high-tech artifacts from a country that no longer really exists. East Germany, the so-called German Democratic Republic, or GDR, was the home of about 16 million people who had to watch the rise of companies like Atari and Nintendo from the sidelines. Here's a metaphor. Sometimes, a cigar is just a cigar. But in the case of Americans trying to get a hold of Cuban cigars, they instead represented the difficult intersection between politics and luxury. Not unlike East Germans trying to get a taste of the rise of video games during the mid-80s. The demand was there. The demand was huge, in fact. But the literal and figurative wall between East Germany and capitalist luxury meant that their games were copies of what people had in the West, and they were made by developers who were under-equipped with knowledge of what they were even copying. There are still Germans to this day who would probably be surprised to hear that the GDR had video games at all. In 1949, the COCOM embargo was enacted by Western countries preventing their companies from exporting modern technology to the Eastern Bloc, and by the 80s that list included computers and electronics. The economic isolation of Soviet countries, plus their government-planned economies chasing after the Marxist ideal of small, self-sustaining communities, meant that supply and demand did not decide what ended up on the market. Government policies did. GDR factories had a hard cap on how many computers they were allowed to produce, and it wasn't enough to sell them on store shelves to the general population. During the months when this system worked, it provided basic necessities at very, very cheap prices. But luxuries like video games were never going to be a big priority, and properly sustaining this system in the first place relied on a workforce that wouldn't leave for the temptation of Western luxuries, which meant that the system didn't work. One-way immigration was the defining problem troubling East Germany economy throughout all of its history. The country's location, within range of Western TV and radio stations, meant that despite strict censorship laws, the people knew about computer games and had reason to get a hold of them. So in the early 80s in the GDR, demand for Western tech was high, and production for homegrown Eastern computers was beginning to trickle into the five-year plans of various Soviet-influenced governments. So although Nintendo released the NES in West Germany in 1986, importing the machine into East Germany wasn't allowed by Western governments. While on the other side of the curtain, Eastern governments wanted that technology, but couldn't import it. But an even higher priority was that they did not want the media that technology could play. Data storage like cassettes, discs, and cartridges weren't allowed through customs. The official reasoning was to prevent Western propaganda from going through the borders. The real reason was more likely to keep the temptation of immigrating to the West out. So while it was legal for an Easterner to bring back a video game machine, traveling outside to get one was a process that required so much paperwork, interviewing, and disposable cash that it was out of reach for most East Germans. Older pension had less travel restrictions than normal citizens. So the usual method was to have a wealthy uncle or grandparent bring over a Western computer to nerdy grandkids back home. So another popular method were these Gen X catalogs, gifts to the GDR, where wealthy Western relatives could send poor Eastern relatives gifts. But this was really only for the filthy rich. The goods were funneled through neutral nations, and all those middlemen had to get paid somehow in addition to the GDR government itself. So about 200,000 Commodore 64, ZX Spectrums, and other Western computers did make it over there, but they could only get there by being imported informally by individuals. There were no big businesses doing this on a real commercial scale. Meanwhile, the Russian solution to these problems, their unofficial NES clone, the Dindy, wasn't to be released until 1992, a couple years after David Hasselhoff tore down this wall. Until then, East Germans were just stuck with knockoff Pong machines that cost as much as a month's salary. So if you were an East German kid growing up in the 80s with average working class parents, PC gaming was the more realistic and popular choice, as it still is right now in Germany. But back in the 80s, kids with the most powerful and expensive machines in the GDR still had to make a lot of compromises. The bizarre rules, contradictory inefficiencies, and clever workarounds faced by gamers living inside this country is archived at this museum. And what fascinated me for days after leaving this place was how different a lot of the GDR's technology was despite the idea being to copycat a lot of existing Western tech. The limiting material shortages and factory allowances is something visible all over the exhibit like on this vinyl record disc that has computer software loaded onto it. For a few years of the 80s, vinyl LPs were a cheaper storage medium over there than cassettes or floppies, not to mention the occasional instances where audio-encoded software was broadcasted over the radio. 
But all of that wasn't super relevant when it came time for a customer to just buy a video game. But it was a hugely limiting factor for the would-be developers at the top of the supply chain who could have been making games during that whole time. The technology embargo and the shortages were the two factors that decided that the gaming market of East Germany and of other bloc countries would be dominated by crappy pirated knockoffs for decades, even after the fall of the Soviet Union. To see these abstract policies and concrete action, here's a more personal story. A spiel on computer spiels, as told by German game developer Andre Weissflog. Nowadays, he's programming for a company called Big Point Games, whose latest big project was a freemium RPG called Drakensang Online, but decades earlier he was one of only a handful of people to ever make money programming games in the GDR. As explained by memoirs on his website, plus in an email conversation between the two of us, Andre Weissflog grew up making his early games in 1987 on the KC-85-3. It was an 8-bit East German computer that used a clone of an American chip from 1976. And though this was cutting edge in the East, it was running at about half the speed of the closest Western machine, the ZX Spectrum, which also used the Zilog Z80s except theirs were the real deal. Although the development of a reliable clone of that chip was a real breakthrough moment for the East, and although their engineers were squeezing more capability out of the KC-85 than the original late 70s computers the chip was intended for, these factors here explain why a lot of Eastern gaming trends across the whole region seem to be stuck at a half decade behind, uh, the rest of the world. And back in late 80s East Germany, the stuff they were putting out looked more like it was from the early 80s. But before all that, Andre didn't have a home computer of his own, so he joined a local computer club that would divvy up time on Z1013s at neighborhood schools. And those were computers that could only output 32 by 32 pixels of ASCII artwork when they weren't displaying black and white lines of text. The KC-85-3 represented the next generation of possibilities to make and play games but its price tag of 3,500 East German marks was roughly equivalent to about one-third of a low-end car. And it was payable in a currency that you couldn't buy a cheaper Western computer in if you could find one. That put it out of most people's reach. In addition to that, normal citizens weren't even allowed to order one. The idea of distributing everything to those that needed it most meant that high-end office equipment was reserved only for business customers. Luckily, Andre Weisslog's parents had a craftsmanship business, so they took a huge leap of faith by switching entirely to self-employment, thus allowing them to mail order their son a KC-85-3 for the family office, which was on paper the business's office, except it was really the living room because they had to plug it into the family TV. Meanwhile, back at the KC-85 factory, production was more focused on pocket calculators. The entire country's worth of computers were being made at a rate of six units per day, so Andre had to wait six whole months for delivery. In the meantime, he played games the best way he knew he could, which was a yearly fair organized by his town that had a guy show up who'd set up a tent, put a bunch of Western arcade cabinets underneath it, and modify them to accept GDR coins. This was the only way you could play older Western arcade games like Pac-Man and Pingo. So Andre would play the hell out of them for a few days, memorize how they worked, and try to deconstruct them in his brain. Then he'd go home and reconstruct them on the KC-85 so he could keep playing them later. Some of his arcade clones are still playable today in a browser window with an emulator he made. And what caught my eye was how he would publish his home address on the game's starting screens. As it turns out, it was a common practice to post ads in tech magazines with your address on them so you could share and even develop software with other gamers elsewhere in the country. Floppy disks were typically too expensive for this, so if it wasn't cassette tapes of software being mailed then it was printed out pages of source code itself. Because sometimes these guys were debugging and building new software with each other through the magazine through the mail. Slowly but surely, a small scene of homegrown East German game development cropped up, and word of Weisberg's game spread up to the company that made his computer. They paid him to update his games for the upcoming KC-85-4, although he doesn't actually know if those games ever made it to mass production. This is the method that other game developers were being hired for to make another notorious GDR staple, the Polyplay, the one and only arcade cabinet built in the country, and for many East Germans, this was the only arcade machine available at all. The Polyplay is a piece of gloriously tacky 70s wood paneling that uses the same Zilog Z80 clone chip to power a cabinet offering a selection of eight games. All of them feature the kind of barely animated grid-based movement that you usually saw in early PC games rather than in the arcades in 1986. 
For comparison, know that this is the same year OutRun and Gauntlet 2 came out. The Poly Play games don't just look but also feel behind their era as well, with the analog joystick snapping you in and out of very digital, stiff, four-way movement. Because it's not really a joystick at all, but a lever mashing down on four buttons below. This is a piece that the museum has since apparently had to replace with a more familiar lollipop design. While authorship of the individual games here remains unknown, the Polyplay's origins is a government project overseen by the East German secret police, the Stasi, became known in the mid-2000s, and I'm not even kidding about that. The Polyplay served a double role as both a recreational source of entertainment, but also as an international propaganda campaign. After news that violent video games like River Raid and Commando were already being banned in West Germany in the 80s, East Germany used that as an opportunity to preach that Western countries were poisoning their children on violent media. In printed media, video games are written as being inhumane and cruel. Most historians point to a 1989 <gasps> Funk Amateur article called Bombs, Bullets, and Slaughter, in which the author rails on the violence glorified in Western games. But of course, if the case was that the games were being made by fellow comrades instead, the party line changed to, quote, Computer games possess subjective tendencies to convey the ideas and values of socialism by means of play and fable. So what did the East German government do in response to the Western government restricting the freedom for their citizens to buy violent media? They, uh restricted the freedom for their citizens to make any violent media at all. As far as the rest of the world needed to know, East Germany's games were going to be the most peaceful and wholesome of all. So anything that ended up on the official government brand Polyplay arcade entertainment device, which ended up in government brand swimming pools, game halls, and other rec centers, as well as the government headquarters in the East German palace, had to meet a secret rating standard enforced by the government's secret intelligence bureau, which meant no war games were allowed, no violence at all for that matter. Even shooting down invading UFO spaceships wasn't allowed. That minigame got pulled as soon as one teacher complained about it. So the poly play they have up and running at the museum in Berlin has a Pac-Man clone. There's a game where you have to bucket up a bunch of water and throw it out the window. You can go skiing. There's kind of an interesting gimmick happening in that one. You have to keep making sharp turns or else you speed out of control. Among all the games here, the only creatures that have to die are the deer in this hunting game at the top of the list which plays like a worse version of Robotron 2084. And there was a morbid joke about this game being tossed around at the time, that it only made it through and got included because Erich Honecker, East Germany's brutal leader of its final 20 years, the guy who would later face trials for the refugees shot at the Berlin Wall, enjoyed hunting in his spare time. GDR's homebrew PC game developers might have gotten hired out to make that stuff, but even what they did on their free time at home didn't escape the eyes of the authorities, as seen in the case of Rymo Bunsen's Revolution. This is a game that has you shooting down USA-backed Honduran Contra rebels to save the Soviet-backed Sandinistas. You'd think the Soviet-influenced authorities would approve of this as a propaganda piece, right? You play on their side of the proxy war. Nope. Weeks after releasing this game, Bunsen's father was suddenly called into the office of his party secretary and grilled about how irresponsible he was to be letting his son program war games. Bunsen would have only been 12 at the time. Three years later, in 1989, Ronald Reagan tears down the Berlin Wall and it's all over. The poly plays are recalled and recycled for scrap. The companies that made the KC-85 are dissolved and sold off to private investors. KC games themselves stop appearing after about 1992. Once the wall fell and superior Western computers came pouring in, KC-85 developers like Raymo Bunsen had their specializations become obsolete overnight. They were very quickly thrown away in favor of Western tech. After making a bunch of games for free and then getting in trouble with the secret police for it and then being stuck knowing a computer no one wanted to work with, Bunsen decided to become a lawyer instead. So even after reunification, it seems to take almost a decade for the laws to change, skills to be redeveloped, and money to be saved all over again before East Germans are finally able to publish and sell high quality original video games on par with the rest of the industry. But the lingering effects of a half century of Soviet influence has left East Germany economically behind its western half, even to this day. The majority of the most famous German games come from companies headquartered in western cities, founded by kids who grew up in western cities. Here's a list of a GameStar editor's favorites, in no particular order, but picked because I felt it would be more representative of the local tastes than, like, a list from Forbes or something. 
So if you ever need an example of the complicated intersection between politics and entertainment, look no further than these stories explaining what it was like playing video games in East Germany. Germany.